Praise the Lord, everybody. Tonight I want to teach on the subject from the book of Zephaniah, chapter 2. Gather yourselves together. In the book of Zephaniah, chapter 2, and verses 1 through 3. It says this, gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord is come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger is come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness, and it may, or rather, uh, seek meekness, it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. We'll just stop right there. Now, uh, this, is, this is particularly dealing with prophecy, and it's Speaking in a way that is a little bit confusing, but in verse number two, he says, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. This is specifically talking about the tribulation period. So the day of the anger of the Lord or the fierce anger of the Lord, that is when he pours out his judgment on Israel, a time that the Bible calls Jacob's trouble, where he will mete out punishment such as the world has never seen before. It will be the ending of the time where Israel has been punished for rejecting him. And it's not something that started when Jesus came. They have rejected God from the very beginning. From the time he called them out of Egypt, they did nothing but complain and whine and cry about what God was doing. They challenged God. They tempted him, the scripture says. Yes, he can bring us out of Egypt, but can he feed us? I mean, they were doing all kinds of things. And and before we beat Israel up too bad, some of us do the same thing. Yes, he can give me the Holy Ghost, but can he protect me? Yes, the Lord is good to everybody but me. We do that. Now, and I'm not talking about this church I'm just saying in general, people have that. We have to fight that inside of us. You know, because we begin to doubt. We, the, the, the devil is a master at doing things like that. He's a tremendous distractor. And one of the things he wants you to do is to believe that it's just you. Everybody else is blessed but you. God helps everyone except you. God promotes everybody but you. That's what the devil wants you to think. The saints come to the church, everybody's happy but you. Yes, look at how happy the saints are. Look at how they're feeling the presence of the Lord. And then look at you, just sitting there. You don't feel nothing. And they're just really feeling it. Well, how do you know what they're feeling? Some folks practice worshiping the Lord. They're not really worship. Now, the, the, Jesus said that God wants worship, but those that worship in spirit and in truth. But a whole lot of times folks worship in practice. They've got their steps down. They know what they're going to do. They know where they're going to go. And it's almost like a choreographed dance. That's not worshiping God. We were laughing here not too long ago about the, the guy that was worshiping God on roller skates. That's not worshiping God. 
Worshiping God with pom-poms. That's not worshiping God. Liturgical dance. See how they, they don't fix it all up. First it was praise dance. But now they want it to be more sophisticated and more accepted. It's liturgical dance. Oh, and they got classes on it. And I'm, let me just say this right now. There's some that when they hear this is going to completely disagree. Pastors I'm talking about even saints, but I'm going to stand as solid as I can. This whole business of dancing in the church is nothing but the devil. There's nowhere in the scriptures. I, I, I asked a pastor one time, I said, what, what, where does this come from, this praise dance? Where does that come from? He said, well, you know, um, the Bible says that the Lord is going to restore the kingdom of David and David danced, so we're just kind of getting ourselves prepared. I said, that is not scripture. Amen. That's deception is what that is. Amen. All of it. And I talked to one of our bishops before he died, and he said, you would be surprised the amount of trouble the pastors, a lot of pastors is having with these young girls that's up here prancing around, dancing with some of the boys in the church. I'm like, no wonder they ever dancing lasciviously. That's not worship. How is bending your body all backwards and your arms all? I can't get this one out there like that, y'all. <laughs> How's all that got something to do with praising God? That's lasciviousness. And it's sinful and it's wrong. And I'll tell anybody it's wrong. And if you disagree with me, I'm more than happy to sit down and let you show me in the Bible where it says that dancing in the church is acceptable. Now they come up with all kinds of stuff. You can twist the scriptures and make it say what you want, but you can't find that. And it, the, to talk about David dancing, and, oh, oh, and they throw Miriam in there too. When they came out of Egypt, she grabbed her tambourine and she was dancing and carrying on. And all they, they want to grab those two things. And I'm not against uh, the Old Testament being a pattern of things today. So let's just let's let's talk about it that way then. When they worshiped the Lord, when David did that, why was he doing it? Because the Ark of the Covenant, God was coming back where he belonged and David broke out in dance. Now, I don't have a problem with that. You come up in the church and you've been fighting the devil all week. And the Holy Ghost hit you. You feeling good because the presence of the Lord is here. You just heard something that delivered your soul. Yeah, go on and, and rejoice and worship the Lord. But don't practice it. Amen. Same thing with Miriam. They just came out of Egypt. What's wrong with realizing I just became free? And I got a little praise in my feet. Ain't nothing wrong with that. No, there's nothing wrong with waving your hands and clapping your hands. Nothing wrong with that at all. But don't practice. That's not worshiping God in spirit. Hey amen. And you know, see y'all keep on saying amen and got me way off. God in here when he talks about uh, in verse number three, seek ye the Lord all ye meek of the earth, we're talking about Gentiles here. And when he says the word meek, seek ye the Lord, he uses it twice in here. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek. And then he says, seek meekness. The word meek means teachable. So seek ye the Lord, all ye that are teachable. See, some folks, you can't tell them nothing. They already know. You want to tell them about the Lord? I know. You sit at home. The Lord is giving you revelation all by yourself. That is not of the scriptures. Let's, let's consider the apostle Paul. He said that he was taught for three years in the desert of Arabia by the Lord. All right. When he got finished, he came right out and started preaching. 
No. He went to Jerusalem and conferred with the apostles first before he went out preaching. Now, I can guarantee you that most preachers today, if the Lord personally taught them, they're not going to anybody conferring. Oh, I know because the Lord taught me. But even the Apostle Paul, the Bible lays out how God does things. You don't sit at home and get a revelation and then go out and start telling folks. I can just say it this way. Every single Christian religious deception, every single Christian religious offness, I, is that a real word? All right. If it's not, somebody write it down somewhere. Every false doctrine that's ever been taught comes from the Bible. You know why? Because there's a right way and a wrong way to divide the word of God. And people that get off divide it wrong. There was a man that got caught stealing. And he used the scripture, let him that stole steal. And he just stopped right there. He left the no more off of it. <laughs> so you can justify wrong by wrongly dividing the word. And a whole lot of folks do that. Yeah. Do you know that the devil is capable of transferring himself into an angel of light? Did you know that? And the Bible says that don't marvel that his ministers are able to transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. They look right, but they don't divide the word right. They mix a little philosophy with some religion and get off. And so he says here, seek the Lord, all ye that can be taught of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, who are working in the judgment of God. Seek righteousness. Seek to be taught. And that is something that people don't do today. Now, now consider this. He says, seek or ye which wrought judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness. Seek righteousness, that's living right. Seek meekness. Today, mostly, I don't, I, when I say religious or anything like that, y'all, I'm not talking about the Buddhist. I'm not talking about the Baha'i. I'm not talking about the Muslims. I'm talking about Christianity as a whole. And today, they don't want to be taught. They want to be teachers. They don't want to live right. They take the word so they, and twist it so they can live wrong. Ain't nothing wrong with this. Show me in the Bible. Going out. Now, the scripture is clear. I'm about to get myself in trouble again. The scripture is clear that God is against tattoos. That's scripture. But we have saints that justify, that go back and grab the scripture, twist it, and say, that's talking about for dead people. That's not saying anything about dead people. He said, nor. Different thing altogether. Don't mark your body. They going out and they think they right because they getting tattoos of crosses on themselves. They getting tattoos of scriptures on themselves. Tattoos of a girly looking Jesus on themselves. I really don't like that, y'all. I don't like no uh, no sissy looking Jesus. No girly looking Jesus. Hair hanging all down and fluffed and feathered and all that. I really don't like that. The scripture. They, now, they'll, they'll, if you look at the Last Supper, we used to have a picture of the Last Supper around here. If you look at that, the men got beards, short hair, but Jesus looked like a girl. Amen. And that's because Leonardo da Vinci 
was a man who wanted to be a girl, he can't sue me, so I can throw him under the bus. <laughs> He's the one that painted the Last Supper. He was a homosexual. So he's going to draw Jesus. If you look at it, some of the apostles in that painting look like women. Right. You ever see that movie? Yeah. What's the name of that movie where they're the Da Vinci Code? Oh, yeah. yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. It, one of them looked so feminine that they said it was Mary sitting at the table with Jesus. And in between the two of them, they've got a V like that, which was the cup. What do they call that? The, the, the cup that Jesus drank from? The Holy Grail. Yeah, the Holy Grail. But, but Leonardo da Vinci painted those men so feminine looking that you could mistake one or two of them for women. And then he gives Jesus real long hair, make him look like a girl from behind. And the scriptures talks about it's a shame for a man to have long hair. But that's okay because... We'll go around and get tattoos of that Jesus all over us. Hallelujah. Y'all ain't mad at me, are you? All right. Somebody told me, somebody told me after last week that uh, I was being grumpy. I'm not trying to be grumpy, but I am getting a tad bit put out with all the foolishness going on in the churches today. The, the world today, they don't want to be taught. They don't want to live right. And they don't want to judge properly. They want harsher penalties for people that hurt their family and milder penalties when it's their family that does wrong. But let's go back to verse 1. He says, gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation not desired. That's the church. Amen. We're the nation not desired. How do we know that he's not talking about Israel here? Because he already tried to gather them. Right now, they're being punished. Right now, they're doing their own thing. He's not calling for them to be gathered together. Amen. He already had a desire for them, and they rejected him. So now the church has become the nation that was not desired. He didn't, when he came, who did he come to? He came to his own, and his own received him not. Yep. So he turned to the one that he didn't desire, which was the Gentiles. That's the church. So now he's telling us, we need to gather together. I, we, we've got more division now in the church over petty things than any time ever. There was a time even when, and, and I'm not saying this to be negative towards any other denomination, but my grandmother was AME, she was Baptist, and then she was apostolic. And she said she can remember down south when they were Baptists, them folks would be speaking in tongues and they'd have to put a rain barrel over them so that the people wouldn't hear them in the neighborhood because they didn't have windows. So they were afraid that they would be, they would come and throw eggs at them and persecute them for what they was doing. And this was Baptist folks. Today, everybody speaking in tongues. You know, they in I don't know if you can remember, but there was a time when it was like, that's why we were different. They were tongue-talking people. Because the church had become a little more sophisticated. And those who were slobbering and carrying on and making a ruckus, they were ignorant and unlearned people. So the sophisticated folks would make fun of them. What are they holy rollers? They fall out on the floor and just get dirt all over them and stuff. It's ignorant people. That's the way they used to talk about them. Now, everybody's doing it. Oh yeah, the devil has gotten really good at what he does. He's uniting his people while we steady fighting each other. And uh, So we, we want to get together and have a, a church meeting. Well, we can't because uh, 
the women in your church don't put doilies on top of their heads. They don't wear those little napkin things on top of their heads. So, no, we can't worship together. Y'all ain't right. It's like, we gonna fight over that? Man, just, and I, when I'm saying doilies, y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? The little, the little bitty things. Now, let me just show you how we get off. When the women were covering their hair in the Bible days, that's exactly what they were doing, covering their heads. They, they would wear the whole thing and cover their whole head. It was like a scarf kind of a thing, and they would cover their head like that. But you know what people do? They start looking for loopholes. I paid $150 to get my hair done. Somebody need to see it, so I'll get me a little bitty square like that. And Bobby pin it to my hair, because they need to see the rest of it, because it's looking good. Bangs is right. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Come on, sisters, help me out a little bit. They look for loopholes to do things like that. So their attitude is even wrong. When you see them with them little bitty things on their head, they ain't, right. they ain't got the right spirit, but they're going to dog you out. You know why? Because the devil is a master at causing us to be petty with each other over little things that don't even matter. Hey Amen. His shoes. Look at his shoes. They don't even come up and cover his ankles. He ain't right. I, there was a preacher that came here one time, and he was talking about um, the, the shoes that men wear, and he said, look, he got heels on his shoes. He's a sissy. He's, that man's a homosexual. It was one of our preachers. <laughs> he was cutting everybody up, just walking down through the aisle, just cutting up everybody. A year or so later, he got arrested for um, a new doctrine that he discovered, which was that when the Bible says that the pastor was supposed to help the widows and the single women in the church, he was helping them including 14-year-old. So he got put in prison for that. It don't, go on and get it. <laughs> Brother was so smooth, he just kind of moved slow and then he just froze. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah. He's calling, now, he's calling a, a man in here with the Holy Ghost, a girl, a homosexual, because he had a heel on his shoe that big, he's calling him a homosexual, and he's a child molester. Predator. See, we, we can be so petty. That, matter of fact, that's one thing that keys me in. When somebody's harping on little stuff, something ain't right. right. Something is not right. Yeah, you, you just want to keep on harping on brown shoes. Keep on harping on brown Something ain't right with you. Because I'm going to tell you something about people. When they're clean, when they don't have anything on them, when they're doing right, when they're trying their best to be pleasing to the Lord, they're happy people. But somebody that's not doing what they're supposed to be doing, somebody that's not living right, always looking at faults and flaws in everybody else. So y'all keep on getting me off. The church, the church was a nation not desired. And what did God desire for us? to gather ourselves together. God has a method of doing things, an order for things. If you go to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 10. Hebrews 10, and starting at verse number 20. Well... Let's start at 22. That's not what I had down, but I want to explain. Because this scripture, part of it is something that we use. And 
it's okay in application, but it's literally, it's not literally talking about what we say. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to do good works. Now just stop right there. What is he dealing with? He's dealing with us living right. He's dealing with us who have been saved, have our consciences clean by the word of God, by the washing of baptism. Those of us who are holding to the profession of our faith. And he said, let us consider one another. So let us be mindful Amen. of each other. And for what reason? To provoke unto love and to good works, right? Amen. So my mindfulness of the saints should be to provoke us right. to live right. And the Bible says that he that is wise win his souls, right? Amen. Yeah. That can apply to those that, are, that already have the Holy Ghost too. It takes wisdom to deal with people. Amen. So if we have wisdom and we are trying to please the Lord, through wisdom we can provoke one another to behave like saints. We can do that. Now, it, what happened is if we're not careful, we'll get angry or frustrated and start picking. But I was telling, I was telling someone uh, last week that a good supervisor doesn't have to demand respect. A good supervisor will gain respect. They will earn respect. And she was telling me that her supervisor on the hot days will go up in the office where it's cool and sit all day long and complain that they're not getting stuff done fast enough. And I said, well, now listen, a good supervisor would get right out there with you and help you. That's how they earn respect. So you don't have to pick at people to provoke them to do good works. What you have to do is live it. And by living it, people will learn to respect you when you stand for something, when you know what truth is and you hold on to it. Not being mean, not belittling each other, but holding on to what is right. Eventually, those that want to be right will be provoked into good works. Now, here's the verse that we get wrong. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Now, a lot of times we take this scripture and we'll say that you in sin because you didn't come to church. That's not what this scripture is saying. Don't get me wrong. You're not going to make it to heaven by not coming to church. But there's plenty of other scriptures to support that. This scripture is dealing with how or where we provoke one another to good works. Where do we do it? In the gathering of ourselves together. When we come together, then you can see how I look, how I act, how I talk. So that's the reason why. We, are, we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together because this is where we provoke one another. This is where we encourage one another. It's one thing to talk to someone on the phone. Yeah. Deacon Scott tells me all, this all the time. I like to talk face to face. Because yeah. I say, well, just call me. I like to talk face to face. Well, 
But there's more. You can gain more by talking and listening and seeing. Did you know, do you know that um, even though you can have your phone on a little hook or whatever, yeah. you've got your earpiece in and you're talking while you're driving, yeah. it's still enough of a distraction that it can cause you to have an accident? Yeah. Because subconsciously we know the fact that the person can't see, when something is taking place, I'll hesitate to stop the conversation because they can't see why I'm hesitating. And so we'll try to compensate and talk at the same time and mess up. They did some research on that and found it out. I was researching something else and come across, I thought it was kind of interesting that the fact that when a person is in the vehicle with you, they're experiencing everything at the same time. So if someone cuts you off, you both shut up till the situation is under control. My brother just did that when we was going to the marriage retreat or back. Someone started to cut him off and we all just stopped. And then when it was over, it's like, whoo, that was, that was something. <laughs> but, but because we were all there, we all knew the situation. That's what happens when we come to church. Because we're all here, we see what's going on. It's not the same as texting. It's not the same as just talking on the phone. It's not the same as running into somebody out in the street. But when we gather together, we all have a common shared experience. Yeah. And God knows that is important for us. He goes on in verse 26. Continuing on with that same thought. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. Where do we receive the knowledge of the truth? From the pulpit. That's where we get it. When we come to church. Now we might gain a knowledge here and there. We read something in the scripture and it's like, oh yeah, I remember when so-and-so was preaching and teaching about this and that, now that makes sense. It's just like your eyes open. But you got to come to church to get it in the first place. You know, the Bible says that the spirit of truth will bring, will, uh, the, the, will bring all things to your remembrance. The Holy Ghost will bring all things to your remembrance. But you can't remember something that you never forgot. So you have to hear it. When you hear it, it's in there. Sometimes you might forget it, but when the time is right, the Holy Ghost will bring it back to your remembrance when it's needed. So, you know, sometimes people say, well, I'm not going to church because it's really not pertaining to me. That's foolish. And let me tell you why. Because you're still getting it in you. There's a whole lot that you hear that don't apply to you right now, but it's getting in you. Then when it's the right time, the Holy Ghost knows how to bring it out of you. Sometimes you don't even do it at a conscious level. Sometimes you just do the right thing because it just feels right. Why does it feel right? Because I've been taught that. Don't even remember it. Who was it? So I was telling one of the saints... I think it was Sister Charity and Brother Christian. They got two babies, two little little fellas. Well, one fella and one little girl. But I said, y'all are teaching your babies things right now that they'll do and never remember how they learned it. When we come to church, the word is getting in us. We're learning it. We may not remember, but we're learning it. So the time somebody makes you mad and you get ready to cuss them out, you may not remember the exact Bible class, but you'll remember, saints don't act like that. So it's getting in you. We should desire the word. We should desire church. We should desire to know what God is looking for, even if it doesn't apply right now. So there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now that's just simply saying this. What did it take for you to get the Holy Ghost the first time? Now not that, that you've gone back too far. He said dying. Now that that that's true. It took death, but 
We call it something today a little different, which is repentance. Yeah. yeah. That, that was the price we had to pay. Yeah. We had to repent. There's no other sacrifice. He said, if we sin willfully, you, you, there's no point. See, what people will do is they'll do a sin and then they'll say, well, the way they're going to make up for it is they're going to give double tithes for three months. They're giving, their self, they're giving their own self a punishment. I've had saints come to me and say, Pastor, I'm just going to silence myself for 30 days. I'm like, well, if you're your own pastor, fine. <laughs> well, I just feel like I haven't been doing all I should be doing. So what they're doing is coming up with a different sacrifice for their wrong. There is no other sacrifice. What is God looking for? The same thing he's been looking for. Repentance. The, David said a broken and contrite spirit. That, see, some folks don't have that broken and contrite spirit, so they make up for it by extra sacrifices. I'll pay extra money. I'll make sure I'll go over and I'll scrub all the bricks on the front of the church. That's not getting you clean with God. That's just extra busy work. Now, if you feel like washing the bricks, get you a bucket and a sponge and whatever and get on over here and start washing. But that's not going to make you right with God. If you sin willfully, there remaineth no other sacrifice for sins. You know, um, I'm going to beat up the Catholics just a little bit. Don't y'all copy behind me, please. So if you sin and you go confess, what do they tell you? Okay, well, I need this many Hail Marys and this many. What is that? That's a sacrifice that you have to make. You have to do the rosary this many times. You, they're giving you a sacrifice for your sin. There is no other sacrifice. You need to repent. Get it right. Repent. And don't do it no more. Well, that, was, that went down real easy. It's, it is the direct responsibility of each of us to gather ourselves together. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, and verse 40. And this is Peter talking. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. If you're looking for somebody else to do it for you, it's not going to happen. And not just salvation. Some folks feel like if they call me, and I, and I want to be careful how I say this because I don't want to discourage people who have legitimate problems. But they feel like, well, if I call the pastor, then it's okay for me to skip church. That's something that you have to deal with God over your own self. I can't give people the A-OK -okay to skip service. I don't, I, don't have the, I don't have the power to do that. If you call and say you're sick, well, amen. If you call and say that you can't make it, amen. But your reasoning has to pass God's test, amen. not mine. Last night, yesterday, I had some work done on one of my teeth, and it took me out. I feel like an old person sometimes. <laughs> I came home from the dentist. My mind was so out there. I think around 7.30, quarter to 8, something like that. I went to bed, fell asleep, and didn't wake up till 7 o'clock this morning. I was exhausted. Something was wrong with me. Now, that's an excuse that has to pass God's test, right. not mine. Right. Why I wasn't at church yesterday. God has to accept that. Amen. I can't call somebody and say, listen, man, I'm feeling really wore out. I don't think I'm going to come to church. That's not going to get me nowhere. <laughs> they was calling me. 
I ain't even, I was like, right on back to sleep. I woke up this morning, I had so many missed calls, like 20 some text messages, like, oh, somebody died? Anyway, save yourselves. You have to be concerned enough about your soul that you are willing to do what God is looking for. I want you to gather together. Amen. That says a whole lot. Because a church, and I'm so thankful I can say that about Christ Temple. But a church should be mixed with all kind of people. Yeah, Old people yeah. and young people. Well-off people. Unwell-off people. <laughs> White, black, Hispanic. Good looking. Good looking. And gooder looking. I ain't getting in no trouble, y'all. I know where the line is. I ain't crossing it. Males and females. We got all kind of folks in this church. And we come together and we laugh and we talk and we worship and we fellowship. But nobody can make us do that. We have to gather our own selves. If you're looking for me to call and tell you, you better get to church, it ain't going to happen. Amen. That's not, that is not the responsibility of the pastor. And I know that folks always want to bring the scripture up about Jesus going and finding the one sheep. Yeah, well, we got a whole bunch of sheep that don't come, so that parable ain't going to work. Right. <laughs> the one lost. Don't forget, he left the 90 and 9. <laughs> we have to strive. We have to force ourselves because flesh want to stay at home on the couch and watch TV. Flesh want to go hang out and do other things. Flesh want to go to the ball games on Bible class nights. Think I don't want to go to? Flesh want to go to the tractor pull. I'm still a little warm over that one. They always have it on a church night. They could just change it to a Monday or a Thursday. That would be nice. But no. But you know what? I haven't been to a tractor pull in years. And I love tractor pulls. But I know what's more important than a tractor. <laughs> My soul, way more important. Amen. Go to the book of Philippians, chapter 1, and verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now, when he uses the word conversation, he's not talking about how you talk. It's about how you live. It's a little old word, but the definition is your, your lifestyle. So only let your lifestyle be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. So what should we be doing? With one mind and one spirit, striving together for the gospel. Not driving folks with the gospel. Sometimes we can get so excited that we chase folks away. I see them doing it in churches. Altar calls finished and they're going out. Come on, come on. They're going out and bothering with folks. You got to save yourself. And that whole business of going out and picking folks out of the audience, the Lord just had me come and get you. That's, that's what we do. We drive people. 
That doesn't cause them to want more. It causes them to be scared. If I go back again, what are they going to do the next time? I don't even bother my own children. And God knows I want my kids saved. I do. But I'm, I, if, if all of my kids were here today and we were given an altar call, I'm not going out in the audience and grabbing them and pulling them. I'm not going to do that. I want them to be saved, but they got to want it their own self. Doesn't the scripture say, choose you this day? If I'm going to do anything, I'm going to sit and pray hard. Move them, Lord. Cause them to come up, Lord. Amen. If we gather together and we're of one mind, we'll see eye to eye, won't we? Well, how come we fuss with each other so much? Now, just to be a little more clear, my wife and I have become one flesh. Isn't that what the scripture says? But she fuss at me all the time. How, how is this possible? We ought to be seeing eye to eye, shouldn't we? 40 years? She was going to do a renewal of the vow, and they got everything, and I was just dreading it. And then she forgot or something. Ooh, she's probably watching, too. I need to, I need to cover my mouth so she can't read my lips. I just got myself in trouble talking too much. Oh, my goodness. Oh. I have. I messed up big time. Maybe she's watching Elder Amos. Isaiah 52. When, when are we going to be seeing eye to eye? Well, let's go to Isaiah 52. You know, we should be striving for it. And it should be in our heart. Isaiah 52 and 8. The watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. We're talking about unity. For they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Till we get to heaven, we're not going to completely see eye to eye. I might as well live with the fact that my wife's going to be fussing at me. Now, I'm just, I'm saying that being silly, y'all. But here's the thing. Saints don't see eye to eye on everything. But it should be our desire. Saints don't see eye to eye on everything. But it should be what we're striving to do. And when you get corrected, you shouldn't be balking up and getting all, Ugh. <laughs> Who they think they are telling me? We shouldn't be doing that. Sometimes we do things. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we do things and somebody correct us and then all of a sudden we got an attitude. It shouldn't be like that. You might get your feelings hurt. You may not like what somebody's saying, but what you should do is measure it. Is it true? The time to measure something is not when your feelings is hurt. That's not the time to sit down and think, huh, were they telling the truth? No, because right now I'm in my feelings. I'm mad. I'm, I'm frustrated or I'm, my feelings is hurt. Let it cool down. Pray about it. Let the Lord let you know, am I really doing that? I'm saying that from experience, y'all. Bishop Johnson had to correct me on something. I didn't get all ruffled up with him. I said, okay. Something I was doing he didn't care for. He wanted it a little different. Okay. Now, I've been corrected enough in my life, starting when I was a little fella, <laughs> that I can just thank God. I went from whippings to fussing at to now just need to have a, just a little something said. All right. My attitude's right. You ain't got to keep on harping on me. If I'm wrong, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Amen. 
Now, let me just tell you what it was so y'all can see where I'm coming from. It is burning up hot in the Dominican Republic. And so we got in the habit of just coming in with a short sleeve shirt, no tie, or maybe a tie, but no jacket, nothing like that. Just come in casual, because it's so hot. He coming in with a suit on all the time. I said, well, he got a different body temperature than I do. I'm sweating like nobody's business. He come in and he said, all right, from now on, all the preachers, especially, I want to see him with suits and ties on. I said, okay. I took my rebuke and went on by my business. Went and made sure that I had me some suits to wear over there where it's burning up hot. I'm not bitter. I don't want y'all to think I'm bitter about it. No. I want to make it to heaven. Amen. That's a little ask. And how long are we in service? Thank God. Thank the Lord. We got a building with air conditioning now. The old building we had didn't even have fans. They just would open the windows. Hot. And we didn't even have this. All we had was it was burning up hot. I bought two fans. Nice them floor fans that blow air from the bottom. You know how they dry carpet? I bought two of those and took them over there. And the saints stole them. I said, they said, no, you didn't bring no fans. It's like, yeah, oh yeah, I did. Bright yellow. I ain't seen nothing like them over here. Somebody sent my wife a picture and who got the fan in the background? I said, ain't that about nothing. I paid like $40 for both of them fans and they just took them. Talking about, I don't know. I let it go. Now that I am a little bitter about. <laughs> St. John chapter 17. Boy, oh boy. People are people everywhere. It didn't stop me from trusting folks. It just stopped me from being so careless. I know where I'm putting stuff now. That's all. St. John 17, starting at verse number 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they will, or that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Verse 22. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. What glory did he give us? Does anybody know? That's right, the Holy Ghost. Holiness. The Bible tells us to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. God gets glory from us being tested and tried and passing it. That's that's how he gets glory. That they may be one even as we are one. I in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. I'll just stop right there. 
there's a whole lot of back and forth talk that Jesus is doing, but there's one thing that I just want to get out of this. In verse 24, that or whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Where was he? Now he's bouncing back and forth with this. I'm in you and you're in me and father and all of this. And he's making it seem like it's two different people. But is it really two people or what? But he was talking through the position of the sonship. Yeah, he was the son of God. And all of this was coming to one point that they may be where I am. Now we have taken on the position of the sons of God. Amen. Beloved, now are we become the sons of God. And the Bible tells us that they that are led by the Spirit, they are the son of God, sons Amen. of God. So now we're in that position. Who is our father? God is. Now we have become his son. Jesus has gone back to heaven. But it's not like there's two different things. After he got, <clears throat> let me put it this way. Oh, I'm out of time. I'll, I'll just do this real quick. God made a body. He put it inside of Mary. He said, that which is conceived of thee is from the Holy Ghost. How about that for a paternity test? If he's calling God the Father and she conceived from the Holy Ghost, somebody's mis mis mixed up a little bit, aren't they? That's because he was acting in a different role. So, he gets inside that body. They crucify him. He said, no man, or no, yeah, no man takes my life, but I lay it down. So if he'd have been, as some taught, that at one point at the baptism, that God got down inside of there, so now there's two people in that body, that's, nothing could be further from the truth. That's how come Jesus was capable of confounding the lawyers at nine years old. Why? Because he was God. So he goes, he gets in that body, and when they put him on the cross, when he said, it is finished, all he did was left it. That's all. And the body without the spirit is dead. So when he took the spirit out of that body, what did he become? God. That's all. He was just God. And some people want to ask foolish and unlearned questions. Well, if that's true, then where if he was God in the flesh, then who was running the universe? Who was running heaven? I think I used this analogy before. If they if they want to test the water in Stone Lake, they don't go drain the lake and take it to the lab. They take a bottle and put some of it in there, and that's a representative Amen. of the whole lake. That's right. That's right. That's right. When God got down inside that body, it was just representative. In yeah. him dwelt the fullness. Everything that God was was inside that body, but it wasn't all of God because Amen. God fills everything. So he just got inside of there. Showing us how to be the sons of God. So when he's talking here and he's praying, he's not praying to somebody different. He's expressing to us exactly what we are to become. Amen. Just like Jesus made the statement, I do always those things that please the Father. There wasn't no sin in him. Is he looking for us to be sinners? No. No. And we should be striving to have that testimony. I do always those things that please the Father. Amen. I do always those things that please God.
That should be our goal. And it shouldn't be something that's a moving target. It should be something that we're hitting. Some folks, they always doing wrong because they're not even striving for perfection. They're not even striving to please God. They're not striving for a testimony that God has pleased with them, that they don't have spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And what's so unfortunate is that it won't be until after the rapture that some folks will understand that fat meat was greasy. It'll be too late then. It'll be too late to say, oops, I, you know what? I should have. It's over now. Especially if you've got the Holy Ghost. Once you get the Holy Ghost, where does judgment begin? In the house of God. There isn't no court of appeals. There isn't no second chances. I hear folks say that from time to time. Well, if I don't make the rapture, I'll just be a beheaded witness. Too late. You can be beheaded if you want to, but you ain't getting to heaven. Because you've already been judged and found guilty. Amen. Oh, yes. I don't want that to happen to me. No, 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 no. I can't imagine facing folks that miss the rapture. And I miss it too. And I'm down here trying to explain to them what happened. Oh, it would be ugly. And I wouldn't blame them. No, I don't want to be hanging around for it. We need to gather together. I, I, we, we'll cover a little more, but um, I'm going on vacation. Hallelujah. I need one bad. I've been working, 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 working. And I know that Deacon Scott thinks I sit at home all day chilling and doing nothing, but he's mistaken. He tells me all the time, you're always on vacation. Mm -hmm. he's, about to, he's about to hear, well, you always silenced. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. The question is online. How is the church, the nation, not desire, desired and why? Because the church is made up of the Gentiles predominantly now. God said that he would save a remnant. And so in the first century, that's what he got. It was like 3,000 at one time, 5,000 at another time. Let's just scatter in another two or three more thousand. Well, we got 10 or so thousand people, 12,000 maybe at the most of the Jews. But today, after that, after the first century, it started swinging over to becoming a Gentile religion, and today it's mostly Gentiles. We were not desired because God intended for Israel to be the head and not the tail. And today, since they put him off to the side, then God had to use people that he didn't desire to be in that position. He had to put them in the position to be the head. Now, today the church should be the head. And now we're the tail. The church should be who the world follows and emulates. But we don't. We emulate the world. We take worldly songs. Because we like worldly songs, we'll try to make them church songs. I found my thrill on Calvary's hill. Fats Domino, trying to bring stuff like that up in the church. Why? Because I liked it when I was out in the world. I get the Holy Ghost. And since I can't give it up, I'm going to bring it into the church. We're doing silly stuff like that. And so we were, we were the ones that God didn't make the promise or the covenant with. He made it with Abraham. And God hasn't completely cast them to the side. If you look in the scriptures, you'll see where it says that he's going to save them in a day. Now, that's going to be during the tribulation period. But, but, but remember this. He's not saving those that weren't living right. 
When he saves Israel, it'll be through the 144,000 of those who have not been in spiritual fornication. And he's going to now, after that, he will populate the world, then he will populate the heavens with the seed of Abraham. That was a literal promise that he made. So we were not desired where we are right now. God desired for Israel to be here, and we should be following them if we want to be right. But it's not like that anymore. Now Israel has to follow us if they want to be right. I mean, I hope that answered the question. Amen. Anything else? I, when I said I was going to be on vacation, please don't skip church, y'all. I know pastors who won't say nothing because they think the people won't show up. At Christ Temple will do it. I'll be over in the Dominican Republic and I'll get a text message, so and so and so and so, and they just go down through the list. Ain't here today. <laughs> to be clear, I didn't ask for the list. I didn't ask to even know. But, you know, saints want to tell me that way I know that they were here. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what they're doing. Just letting me know. I was at church, but guess who wasn't? Don't skip, y'all. Don't do that. Hey, Amen. We, we got good ministry in this church. Hey, Amen. And if you can't see eye to eye with them, come anyway. And, 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 and be spiritual, make it in the rapture, and then we will see eye to eye. Amen? Amen? All right. Stand on your feet.